Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. We have two guests today on the Cognitive Crucible. The first is Dr. Ajit Mann, who is a security and defense policy analyst and a specialist in narrative strategies and radicalization processes as well. She is also the author of seven books and is the CEO founder of Narrative Strategies. Also joining Ajit, and by the way, Ajit also goes by Gigi, and you'll hear me refer to her as Gigi. Also joining Gigi is Mr. Paul Kobaugh, who is retired from the U.S. Army as a warrant officer after a distinguished career in the U.S. Special Operations Counterterrorism Community, per- primarily focused on mitigating adversarial influence and advancing U.S. objectives by way of influence. Gigi and Paul, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thanks for having us, John. We're glad to be here. Delighted. Thank you so much, John. The conversation that I would like to have with you today is all about the narrative terrain. What a narrative is, how narratives differ by culture, and even narrative structure. And then also get into your recommendations to information operators and policymakers. But before we get into that, um, I'd like to start off with Paul. You, you've got a really interesting uh, vignette that I would like for you. I, I, maybe it's not a vignette because I, I believe that this is a, 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 a real uh, story from your days in uniform. So you guys were kind enough to share with me your co-authored book, uh, Introduction to Narrative Warfare, a Primer and Study Guide, and we'll have a link to this in the show notes, by the way. At the beginning of this book, Paul, you share this encounter that you had with a captured Taliban fighter. Uh, do you think we could start off with, uh, with, with you recapping this for our audience? Certainly, I'd be glad to, and I'll try to abbreviate. It's a hair, hair bit long, and I'm going to refer to my notes because it has been 11 years, and I'm old. So... No. It was 2010, my second um, Christmas holiday deployment in a row, in the first, in the second of five years in a row in Afghanistan. And having not done well the first year out in the influence department, basically because I used doctrinal approaches, I came home and I said, I can't do this again. I'm not, I'm not satisfying the customer. And I was very fortunate to have an elite customer and I wanted to prove prove that we could get something done for him. So I went back, went back to the shop and spent the next few months before my next deployment getting serious about the identity of who my Pashtun fighters were in far eastern Afghanistan. It was a, a myriad of Taliban and HIG and uh, a variety of the Haqqani-sponsored extremist groups at the time, of which was born a Khorasan group, now known as ISKP. So I sat down with one of our detainees after an evening off, and this is this story is about that encounter. The young Pashtun Taliban fighter glared defiantly at me across the smoke-filled room from the interpreter's perpetually lit cigarette. It was dusty, it was cold, deep December. And I sat there looking at him and I thought, I'm gonna employ something, I'm gonna try a new tactic that I worked out over the previous few months. So I sat there upright, open eyes, and leaning slightly back, speaking in a very low voice. He didn't know that he was going to be my guinea pig in this new experiment. And what would involuntarily trigger in him over the next hour or so surprised him as much as it did me. As we sat there, I began to speak in a very slow voice explaining that if the army allowed it, and by the way, I was in civilian clothes, I sat upright, leaning a little bit back. I told him in that low voice, forcing him to lean into me and show deference, that I was going to talk to him about some stories about honor and shame based on his tribal affiliations and his upbringing. He was puzzled. 
his defiance just slipped away. It literally melted away and I could see it in his eyes. He was confused. He wasn't sure what was coming because he was used like all of his colleagues in the uh, Taliban HIG world. He was used to being debriefed by not only the Taliban when he would return to service, but also by US in interrogators and interviewers. So as I sat there upright, forcing him to show deference to me as an elder, I reminded him that if the army had allowed it, I would have a gray beard. And that is a very special significance in Eastern, Af actually in all of Afghanistan, especially within Pashtun tribes. It says that I'm an elder, and not only do I want respect, but you are obligated by, by Pashtun Wali, literally the way of the Pashtun, to give me that respect. He wasn't used, to, he wasn't ready for that. He didn't know that I knew anything about him. He just figured I was going to come in and ask him the same types of questions that he was used to from the last time he'd been detained and from the, the stories he'd heard from his other fighters. So with him on his uncertain ground, I sat down and I started to talk with him. But I didn't ask questions, really. I didn't really ask anything about the raid. I didn't ask anything about the op that where he was captured. I didn't even ask anything about the extremism that he was following. He just switched over from Taliban to Hig, and which is very common among Pashtun fighters. They change sides overnight. It's very common. But the ideology is similar. Never the same, but it's fairly similar. So he, as he sat there, very confused, I started to ask about the different tenets of Pashtun Wali, which I was already familiar with. And Pashtun Wali, the, literally the way of the Pashtun is all about honor. It's the honor code that has predated Islam in that part of the world, not only just within Pashtun society, but also amongst a variety of different tribal factions. So now he was really uncomfortable, but he sat up a little bit. He didn't know whether to be resilient, didn't know whether to be defiant, or just to try to soak it up. But he didn't have a choice. I'd already triggered him. And I, even though I didn't realize at the time that I was dealing with narrative, I'd already triggered his, his identity itself. So we sat there and just talked, I even offered him a little tea, which he accepted grudgingly, but he took it. And as we talked, I started to ask about his patrilineal foundation. Pashtuns are a patrilineal society, and depending on where you are in the hierarchy and the, of, of the males in the clan, that, that depends on your success and your potential for success as you grow older. I suspect he was 16, give or take a year or two, because birthdays are not a big deal in that part of the world, and hardly anybody has a birth certificate. So I'm guessing it was around 16, healthy, ready to go out and fight, just full of them and bigger. But that's not what was triggering him right now. That's not what was bothering him. So I, as we sat there and talked about how his father portrayed Pashtun Wali, whether or not he was honorable or not, how his cousins and how his older elders within the village and within his clan, how they dictated Pashtun Wali and how they represented it in their actions. I could see him start to question in his eyes and he would sit back and he lowered his shoulders a little bit. And he was starting to get visibly uncomfortable because as he was talking and explaining to me all these things that I already knew, because I'd done my homework, he started to realize he was condemning himself with his own words, that he had not only shamed himself, he'd shamed, shamed his father, his cousins, his tribe, the people he was allied with fighting. And then it finally dawned on him, you could see the light bulb go off in his eyes, that everything he had been doing, whether it was HIG or Taliban or any of the extremist groups that he would change sides and fight for, he realized that he was on really shaky ground as far as family goes and as far as his village goes and as far as his chance goes to be ever be access, a successful member of his tribe. By the, end of the, by the end of the interview, probably about an hour and a half into it, he had physically withdrawn. He had kind of drawn his legs in the, from the folding chair back up into his chest, and he started to rock sl very slowly, very slightly. He had triggered all of the emotion and shame from his own condemnation of his actions 
and it was starting to boil up in him. And by the time we finished, he was literally in tears, his arms wrapped around his knees, pulled all the way to his chest, and he was sobbing into his knees. That's how powerful the shame was within him, because all of the old identity that he'd been born with and had been transferred to him from generations upon generations upon generations of his tribe and family, all of that welled up in him because he knew he had condemned himself and his only way out was to redeem himself by way of the code, by way of the Pashtun Wali honor code. And at the, end of the, at the end of his sobbing, I just sat back and allowed, him, allowed myself to take into situation. And he saw that I approved, although I didn't smile, I didn't give him anything. He knew that I understood that he had an obligation to fulfill. And he knew that he had that obligation to fulfill, not only to me as an elder, but most especially to his family and to his father. At that moment, his ties to the Taliban narrative that he'd been fighting for were broken. Now, if we could sustain that, if we could sustain the narrative of honor and shame, which is my whole campaign, that, de that deployment, then we could keep him broken for a while until maybe somebody came in and offered the opportunity to the tribe and the family to succeed in a different way. But for that moment, he was done with being one of the extremists on the other end of a rifle that, I mean, on the bad end, let's put it that way. At that point, I went back and I wanted to teach. I had to sit down and delve through this whole experience because I was as shocked as he was at his, re at his responses. And I realized that this was a full-blown tactic that needed to be used in a powerful way by anybody trying to influence and support of our national security goals. It wasn't until five years later after I retired from the army that I met Gigi and I met some others in our group. And I realized that this had a name. I was employing narrative principles using narrative itself as a rhetorical tool to achieve what all the arms and all the time we spent in Afghanistan couldn't. We could switch the drive and the motivation and the focus of people just by engaging them for who they were, if we did if we did our homework, if we paid attention. Unfortunately, after I met Gigi, she actually gave me the background, the academic foundation for what I was doing, and I learned to develop more and more principles. But I always taught that to every team that succeeded me, no matter where I went, because that was their power. And eventually, I I just changed the circumstances, the net, the names, and shapes in my campaign when I moved to the north and then to the south. And I just applied those the exact same narrative principles to achieving success. And that the bottom line to all this, and this is what the military needs to understand operationally, is if you employ narrative principles at the core of your campaign and sustain them, you can have an impact. And I saw that impact in the number of times that the Taliban was allowed to traverse our, ter our territory that we were in charge of. Because then the Taliban had to stop, talk to the elders and negotiate whether or not they could trans tra traverse the uh, terrain. Elders got more respect, less young men went to join the Taliban and it generally improved the whole circumstances in those three provinces for another six months. I was very fortunate. And I'll probably have talked long enough there, so I hope that helped. No, that, thanks, Paul. The, nothing like a war story to uh, start off a discussion like this. And I, I think that really helps um, uh, nest this uh, conversation into a you know, real live um, uh, event that took place that was successful. And so I, I think our audience will appreciate, you know, uh, considering how they can employ these same kinds of uh, strategies as we address this this uh, competition uh, below the level of armed conflict. Uh, so, uh, so uh, Gigi, perhaps we can turn to you. So, could could you maybe give us a uh, origin story on your your firm and uh, uh, maybe add 
just a little bit of a you know, punctuation as to you know what Paul was just talking about. Sure. Um, Narrative Strategies LLC came up very organically. I'm not a business person and had no intention of starting a business. What happened was um, on my third book, uh, I wrote a book called Counterterrorism and the, the subtitle was Narrative Strategies. And what I did in that book was I looked at, what I did for background on the book was I looked at hundreds of terrorist recruitment narratives. My interest wasn't primarily in terrorism or counterterrorism, but it was primarily in looking at what are the nuts and bolts of storytelling that motivate people to do such extreme things as homicide and suicide. Because if you can explain that extreme behavior, then less extreme behavior is easier to understand. And now, so when I'm talking about recruiting, I mean the kind of recruiting where there's no financial motive, you, there's no gun to somebody's head. There is, you know, you, you haven't kidnapped some, you know, it's not that kind of thing. It's uh, what do you say to people online to get them to take up arms, to strap on a suicide belt, belt onto their kid or to, you know, buy a ticket to Syria? What, what are, what's happening there? And what it is, of course, is storytelling. Um, so that, that book had this tremendous impact and we took the, the business name from the subtitle of the book. Um, as a result of that book, Paul introduced himself to me and a whole bunch of other people that are essentially from the soft community um, introduced themselves to me and they were pretty excited because they now had a theory for stuff they were doing and they didn't exactly know, you know, they kind of felt it out and they kind of uh, like, well, just what Paul was just describing, they were kind of flying by the seat of their pants. And then what would happen sometimes is they were very successful. And then they did the same thing in another culture, and they were less successful. And, you know, they would call and say, you know, I read your book, we did, you know, can you explain why I was successful over here and not successful over there? And we got into the this conversation. And so what we have now, the, the team members of Narrative Strategies are those original folks. Um, we have taken on only two new people. So that is the original group of friends who came together. And, you know, so they were excited to find something that they could use as doctrine. And I was excited that I could be helpful in a very practical way. So it was, you know, it, it, our energy it has been maintained. I mean, it's just, we really enjoy interacting with one another. And so we're that kind of, we're kind of, we're friends, you know, and that's, uh, that's our team. Um, so we just needed, other people started getting interested in what we were doing. So we needed a way to, you know, brand ourselves and to get paid. And so we registered ourselves as a business, but that's sort of, we, we operate as that same group of friends who is, you know, interested in, in narrative and what is possible with it. So that's the origin of our, um, our group. And I should also say that we don't do, we don't focus on like strategic communications. We don't focus on the rhetoric, rhetoric or rhetorical side of storytelling. Um, we are also not you know, into what, what is called themes and messages. We're not focused on that sort of thing. We come to it from a social science background, uh, a perspective from which narrative is a foundational cultural thing. It's a part of an environment that people are born into. One of our colleagues talks about, and I think you mentioned it earlier, John, the narrative terrain. Um, all cultures have some sort of narrative terrain they're different, different cultures have different trains, but um, all cultures have it. And it's, it's from there that we come. We're talking about narratives as something very, very basic to um, human identity. Yeah, thanks for that uh, origin story, Gigi. You know something, and before we get deeper into this discussion, I hear the word narrative a lot, uh, like, you know, narrative is is almost like cyber or 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 quantum these days if somebody just 
sprinkles narrative into their discussions about you know today's national security environment then it, it, it's almost like a buzzword so i, I don't know do, do you have any um more of a formal definition of narrative or what what are the kinds of things that you hear that are eh, and that's not really narrative this is what i'm talking about i'm talking about cultural narratives i'm talking we're coming our team is coming from a social science background so we're not coming from stratcom and rhetoric you know that kind of area i do um i'm glad i'm seeing uh, the, the military integrating a bit of academic understanding about what narrative is. I mean, some of us have PhDs in this topic. It would be good to implement what we know. Um, you know, an analogy is like my, my, my neighbor probably has a handgun, but you probably don't want him coming in teaching, you know, your troops. Um, so lots of people think lots of things, but it, it's not. It would, it would be terrific to bring in people who actually know and have backgrounds in academic narrative and aren't using the term the way the guy on the street is. Because there's been years and years and years and years and it's a multidisciplinary study. There's all kinds of background that can be brought in, academic background that can be brought in. And we're seeing it trickle in a little bit, but there's still this kind of pedestrian understanding of narrative. The same way my neighbor would describe it, you know. Um, so, so we need to get past that, and we need to not assume that we know what the word means, because it does mean something different from an academic standpoint. If I could just add just one little tagline at the end, it's that we see so many people that say they understand narrative, and they're out there tr trying to teach or trying to write about it and have influence within the national security community, and it's not that we or opposed to them having an interest. It's just that we know what happens when you start on a bad course. By the time you get further out, you're really off course. And that's what we're afraid of. If people don't bring in the right expertise, then they're not gonna have a good understanding and hence will probably not succeed in using narrative at the core of their influence. As I mentioned previously, our audience uh, tends to be people who are either within the national security establishment or people who are especially interested in information related national security matters. Uh, could one of you maybe uh, talk about how, how would you introduce the concept of narrative to an audience like this? Well, I'd like to tag in on that. And I think Gigi, you have some points probably after I say a couple of things, but there are two things that this, the national security community needs to know about narrative. First of all, narratives employed as a rhetorical communication tool, they need narrators. And that means top to bottom. So building a relationship between narrators and audiences is key. That means perpetual engagement. We can't just do this when a crisis pops up like we're doing now. We literally have to have from the strategic level all the way down to the tactical level, nested narratives with narrators that have a relationship with specific audiences. And that requires, number one, the most important thing, and it's something that the intelligence community does not do right now, it requires narrative analysis of the identity of those audiences. This is not target audience analysis as we know it. This is a very specific type of analysis, unique to narrative itself and built exclusively on narrative, sound narrative principles. So we have to collect the information that tells us literally who someone is and how many shared layers they have with other people in their group or their related audience, because that's the key. You cannot trigger something you don't know. You have to know who they are if you use narrative as a rhetorical tool. And the rhetorical tool needs to be the core of operations. Themes and messages are subcomponents of a core sound, a sound core narrative strategy. They're not, they're not at the top of the heap. We can't, all themes and messages will only work based on basically random luck, unless they're associated with the type of analysis required 
and the, the ISC needs to learn what that is and how to do it. And if you don't know who, who somebody is. So Gigi, you have something to add to that? As a follow-up there too, and maybe Gigi, you, you can add this into whatever you were going to say. What are some of these analysis techniques or what, you know, what are, what are just maybe some of the really rough steps that an, an organization needs to consider in order to derive these kinds of um, analyses? I'll throw out a couple of categories and, I'll and then Gigi can tell us far better than I can about why they matter. So the key components that we look at is, first of all, we do the deep dive on the history. From that history, we also have to look at the anthropology, ethnography, sociology. We got to look at timelines of significant events. We have to look for traumas or major successes that impacted the identity of the groups that we're talking to. They're everything that makes them who they are. And this relates to what Gigi will probably talk about at some point is the meaning map between people's ears. Because what we're trying to trigger is the already established way that people derive meaning about what happens around them. And that is unique to each individual person. And that individual person within a group shares a lot of those same layers. Yeah. So another way to put it is the reason that storytelling works when it is influential and the reason it doesn't, if it's not, is because it either triggers the way, the, the, the basic narrative that we talked about, this is the social narrative that has socialized the members of a society within it. So if you tell a story that just doesn't resonate with the way your target audience has been enculturated, then you're just talking to yourself. It's going to fall flat. You have to tell a story that triggers their, and this is very specific, their identity and the way they give meaning to their environment. So, so a way to put, and then let me say it the other way around. Um, narratives are cultural things. They're the way that a culture has decided generation after generation after generation to give meaning to their surroundings. What does it mean that there are these sparkly things up in the sky at night? What does it mean that they seem to have certain patterns? Why is the world the way it is? And specifically, what difference does it make to me and mine? What does it mean for me? Not just abstractly, who am I in all this? So, you know, you've heard people say that human beings are meaning seeking creatures, but we don't reinvent the wheel each of us individually, right? Um, our cultures have figured out how they're gonna give meaning to our environment, our, both our physical and our social environment. And we, we learn it. We are so, that's part of what being socialized means. We internalize the way our culture gives meaning to our experience. And, and that internalization is what I call, you know, they get the meaning map. So individuals, learn that very early in their development. Um, I bet none of us has literally, I mean, how many of us has constructed a wheel? But we learn to use wheels really early on in our lives. We don't reconstruct wheels. Um, the same is true of, of so many things. People have done it before and we simply learn how to ride on what they have constructed before. And we're not highly conscious of it. And that's a very important thing. Um, we are conscious of storytelling and we like storytelling and we like to hear stories and our brains are very receptive to incoming information that's in story form. But we don't sit around talking about narratives usually. We talk about stories. Um, the, the narratives that are the foundation of those stories are what we need to focus on if we're interested in influence. I see. We need to do storytelling that directly attaches to the target audience's cultural narrative. When we do that, it's gonna be, they're not gonna be, nobody's gonna think, ting, oh, that's about my identity. They, you know, because we're not highly conscious of that, they're just going to be influenced. That's important to know on the other side of things, you know, that's where weaponized narratives hit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this starts getting into 
uh, for me at least. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of quotes from your book that I'd like to uh, read, uh, which which starts hitting on these kinds of things. And then I'd, I'd like to ask you guys to, to respond to them. So here, uh, two, two different quotes. Here's the first one. Um, the art and science of narrative, when done well, does not allow the audience to derive their own meaning. The narrators control this. That's the first quote. And then the second one, narrative has the power to trigger predictable behavior. Um, it sounds like you were you were going in this direction just a moment ago, Gigi. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll let uh, Paul, that first quote is Paul's and I'll let him explain that. But um, sure, when you're the narrator, uh, you're telling a story that does what I just described and it doesn't allow, we don't allow the audience to just make stuff up. This kind of contains what they are able to, how they are able to frame their experience. So um, the other way to put it is once you've been enculturated and you've internalized that cultural narrative, information incoming is going to be sorted cognitively depending on that sort of narrative framework in your head. It's going to determine why you will disregard certain incoming information why you will regard certain incoming information as highly dangerous, for example. You might be alarmed by some information and another guy with a different meaning map in his head might not be alarmed at all. So how we interpret information incoming will depend on that meaning map that we have internalized from our culture. And it won't be, there's really no, um, you know, when people talk about, let's change the narrative. You're talking there about something pretty serious. That's social change that you're talking about. But when you're in a hurry, <laughs> um, you don't want to engage in social change. I mean, that might be part of long-term planning, probably is. But um, what you want to do is storytelling that attaches to the narrative that already exists. People are not blank slates. They're not just a white canvas that you can go and slap your narrative on. They have a narrative already going. And you have to communicate with them in, in such a way that attaches to that thing in their head that's already there. Let me just say this about what Gigi was talking about. And let's relate it to the story I told at the beginning. When we teach and mentor people in organizations, we use a formula that we patented or copyrighted, whatever the right term is, about meaning plus identity plus content plus structure equals narrative. Well, structure is something very important. And what we're trying to trigger, let's put it this way. If we do narrative analysis the way we need to teach the IC to do it, that it paints us a, as clear a picture as possible of that meaning map that Gigi's talking about. If we understand what that map looks like in somebody's head, then the overwhelming majority of what they're gonna do, the actions they will take based on information and stimulus, they will take that action involuntarily. Because, but if, and if we understand that map, we know where we can inject and how to inject the right information to, to get that predictable triggering. But that requires really serious in-depth and evolving intelligence collection and analysis by somebody that knows how. And that doesn't exist currently within the IC unless you draw, take people from one place or another and you kind of fuse them together then you can get close, but we still don't collect all those things. But what we're trying to do is to, once we understand that map, we know where we can drive people without them even having a, a conscious understanding of that they're being driven or herded. So what y'all are describing sounds like a uh, capability which requires deep uh, expertise and, and resourcing, and it's not something that can just be uh, manifested in a short period of time. And, and so I, I'm certain that we already have, you know, deep cultural expertise in, in lots of different uh, areas of the world. But then overlaying on top of that, this 
mindset that you guys are are surfacing and um, uh, advocating is uh, challenging, even with this cultural infrastructure in place. So, wow, what a what a project. Um, I'd like to turn to one of my favorite topics. I've brought this up a number of times uh, on the podcast. And so some in our audience may be sick of me talking about it, but you know, that's just the way it goes. Uh, one of my uh, heroes, I guess, is a, a guy named Joseph Campbell, who uh, famously was a comparative religion scholar from the mid mid 1900s to the latter part of the 1900s and uh, last century and um, really interesting guy. And he wrote a book, very famous book called, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually going to maybe, it, it's either called The Hero's Journey or The Hero with a Thousand Faces. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. Very interesting book. But he, he, he talks about some of these things that I think you guys would uh, would agree with uh, about how the, there's there at least in the West there is this narrative which really resonates with a, with a lot of people called the hero's journey. Uh, could could one of you maybe just very briefly recap that and and also maybe help nest it into this conversation? Sure. The hero's journey, and we have our own brand of it in the United States, maybe kind of like the cowboy journey. Um, but the, the, it's a Western cultural sort of archetype. Um, Campbell would have called it that, and his mentor, Carl Jung, would have called it that. Um, it goes like this. It's, it's so familiar to all of us. And I'm glad you brought this up, John, because we can distinguish now between narratives and stories using this as an example. But hero's journey is a cultural narrative. And there are a whole bunch of stories told in that vein that reference it. In other words, those stories get their meaning from their reference to the cultural narrative. The cultural narrative goes something like um, there's a, a beginning state. And, and by the way, this is an Aristotelian uh, model. Aristotle talked about this um, in, in, in very simple terms in the poetics. If people want to look at that, it's a very short book. It's easy to read. Um, and, and so it goes that there's a beginning harmonious state. Everything's great with this hero. Something is introduced, some sort of conflict, some kind of problem. And the hero in this very Western narrative that is not a universal narrative and is not shared by the rest of the world and we who are enculturated by it tend to think that it is shared, tend to think that it is just the way things are. And it's not, it's just the way things are in our culture. Um, so the, the beginning harmonious state, a middle state where our conflict is introduced, the hero separates himself out from the rest of his culture or his clan or his family. And by doing so, it's what shrinks call individuates. He individuates by separation and he journeys. Now that means he, he travels somewhere. There's, there's linear progress. Um, you know, it goes from beginning to middle and end as Aristotle said, very simply, beginning harmonious state, middle state with a conflict. And then there's generally a resolution at the end, the end, the hero may get what he wanted, or he may get some sort of version of what he was questing after. But the important thing about his journey is that he has changed significantly in that journey. So, and now the thing to keep in mind here is there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, our stories that we tell about ourselves, if I ask an American person on the street, um, what narrative do you live by? They're not gonna, they're gonna interpret that as meaning stories because we don't talk about narratives in that, you know, they're not academics and they don't understand what we really mean by that word. They're gonna think we mean stories. And they're gonna tell a story, you know, we all have stories in our heads that we live by. And 
that story is going to reflect the cultural narrative. It's going to have a beginning. You're going to probably describe yourself as being in on somewhere along that linear line in, in time. Um, importantly, I, I'll just point this out quickly, with terrorist requir requir recruitment narratives, the ending is just projected. The ending is up to you. It it's, makes the target audience compelled to end the narrative the way they want to by taking up whatever action is required. So that's a that's the hero's journey narrative. You know, it, it has that kind of linear progress from beginning to middle and end. There are other types of structures. Um, and that's important to point out because a lot of people will not recognize a narrative, a foundational narrative in another culture, if it doesn't sound something like ours. Mm. So it's important to understand our cultural narrative is not universal. It's just our cultural narrative. And other people's cultural narratives go in a lot of different ways. They have a lot of different content. They give meaning to their experience in different ways. They identify with the narrative in different ways. And the narrative structure itself is even laid out differently sometimes. So it, for example, it may not be linear, it may be cyclical. And we might not recognize that as a narrative if it doesn't go in the way that we're accustomed to. Right, right. I, I, I should have mentioned this at, when I was uh, talking just a moment ago, but uh, th there's also another really interesting discussion along these lines um, on this podcast with a fellow named Joseph Lee, who is a, who is a Jungian analyst, and, and we go into some of these things with archetypes as well. But yeah, uh, Gigi, so it, it seems to me like you know, this, this narrative for well, I mean this 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 podcast forum tends to be a a audience of the West. Um, so this narrative that you were describing around the hero's journey is so part of yeah. our yeah. uh, lived experience, or so part of our. It, it, it's like we're fish in the fishbowl of exactly. you know, of of this kind of a narrative that it's just transparent, but. Um, we, you know, it, it it's also pervasive through our uh, culture in 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 movies, mm -hmm. for example. You know, some. I mean, this is just like you could you could almost like randomly pick a movie, <laughs> and that the the likelihood that this hero's journey can be mapped onto or you know grafted onto the structure of this movie is probably pretty high, which is uh, partly explains you know, what, what differentiates a really successful movie experience from something that might be less successful. Would you say that, 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 that there's, there's probably something to that? Yes, I would, except that I would say that the movie is grafted onto the narrative. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, very good, very good, I, I, I get you. Yeah, so those are stories. So all those stories that we tell, that, we're, that we love, that we're conscious of, that we pay money to go see, all those stories, get their relevance by by being grafted onto that cultural narrative even in terms of structure mm, yeah yeah for sure um do you think that uh narrative is better understood in different areas of the world so I mean, you, you were just describing a narrative that is the that would resonate with the west but do other cultures, other uh, places of, of interest to the national security community. Do you do you get the sense that that other places like get this concept and and the utility more so than um, you know our culture does? Yes, and I, I'm not quite sure why. I think that maybe um, cultures that are have more oral traditions or have maintained the the oral traditions that they've had um, even now are more sensitive to um to to narrative and the the sort of cultural background of the stories they tell um it is pretty remarkable that we aren't <laughs> uh, we don't know if you ask somebody um what is your cultural foundational narrative 
I think you'd have a hard time getting people to answer that question. But you can ask them, what's your story? And they'll answer that question. They probably don't know what that maps onto very well. Because people don't have conversations often the way we, you know, the type that we're having right now. And that makes us more vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to, you know, wrap up if I may and like ask one of those, you know, if you were in charge for the day or if you had the uh, proverbial, the, the elevator ride with uh, with a really influential person, the, the president of the United States or, you know, so, somebody like that. And, and, and you could impart, you know, just like one or one or two key points. What, what are the kinds of things that you would want to communicate to somebody who can, can make a difference? Gigi, I made a list, but if you want to go first. <laughs> I'll be brief and then you can do the whole list. Um, I would say that our national security strategy should be in narrative form and we should understand it as a cultural narrative for the, well, for the entire country, but certainly for the defense community. And we need to understand the difference between narrative stories, themes, and messaging. We need to understand it, I think, backwards from how we currently do. We think of narrative as some sort of highfalutin you know, frosting on the top kind of stuff, like a, like a theme. And it's not, it's the other way around. It's very, very fundamental and it's very basic. And as we get up, um, you know, then narratives, then stories, then themes and messages. The themes and the messages are really the highfalutin conscious activity. The narrative is not a highly conscious activity. And then the other thing I would simply say, is that as complicated as this sounds, and it does get complicated when you're doing, when you're get, gaining intelligence, when you're analyzing it, and when you're operationalizing it. But this is not complicated, theoretically. This is not rocket science. This is stuff that we kind of know. It's like we just have to be reminded. So theoretically, it's not difficult. And I'm focused on the theoretical part, so my job is pretty easy. <laughs> I'll let Paul take the hard part. Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, John, I'm not going to talk to the president. I'm going to just, I want to go sit down with the National Security Council, the chairman, and somebody from state, maybe somebody from the Global Engagement Center. I want to tell them, first of all, where their immediate vulnerabilities are and their, and their omissions from being successful. And I, let me just tell you, very briefly first, the president, the sec dev, the sec state, and Jen Psaki right now are doing a terrific job, my professional opinion, as far as narrating the situation with Ukraine. The problem is, and this is going to go to the vulnerabilities we have in the national security community, is they can't do it by themselves, nor should they be expected to. As, like we said before, narratives require narrators, and that's from top to bottom in every region that's tuned in and oriented just towards our region. So press releases are a failure by themselves. And it, the reason is because, just like Gigi was explaining, they don't tell you the meaning. They just give you sterile facts. Narratives, as a rhetorical tool, are not about facts. They're about meaning. The problem is... We have to always go first because I assure you, the one thing that our enemies and our adversaries and competitors understand is that if we just give a press release, they can assign the meaning to the situation first. And once you start, once you allow them to control the meaning, counter narratives won't work. You have to sustain yourself in the environment as a narrator. If you have 51% of people that prefer to hear what you have to say, then anybody else, then, then you can control things to some extent. But you got to go first, and you have to tell everybody what it means. Just saying on X, Y, and Z day, we had 37 missions, and they accomplished X, Y, and Z. That's, that's not going to help. You have to tell people why that matters to them. And that's got to be part of your daily, regular discourse. Anyway, we have to have sustained, sustained campaigns. Right now, DOD does not sustain their campaigns. They have 
countless really bright, amazing, motivated people that really want to be in the fight, but they're, they're hobbled by a Byzantine structure architecture of Department of Defense. And we have to remember that all this, all success base is based on whether or not we understand that meaning map really well in our audience's heads. And that matters. One thing that Ukrainians are doing really well is through social media, they are instinctively establishing meaning and they're triggering the meaning map in a variety of audiences brilliantly. Why can't we do that? I mean, we invented marketing, basically. We should be able to do that, but we're somehow we're sitting on our hands. But we gotta we gotta take all that talent and all those resources we have because there's it's overwhelming how much we have at, at our beck and control. Is we have to get them in the game, sustain campaigning, and that means we have to talk about talk to China about how this matters to China. At the same time, we're talking to Russia about why all the different parts of NATO and the region and Russia and all that, why it matters to them. We are going to be talking to South America because South America is being uh, sold Russian and Chinese narratives. We have to be proactive. And that's where Gigi went with the national security strategy. That national security strategy written as a narrative tells everybody in the world as a public document, publicly available document, what the meaning is of the U.S. national security community. And that needs to be done with in conjunction with state and in every ambassador, every regional bureau, every combatant command, influences the game. It doesn't matter if you're shooting at each other, influence is always the core. All influence is narrative centric, if you understand about the principles. So we gotta get this to the core and start to the core of our operations and campaign. Anyway, yeah. I could go on about this forever. Yes, yeah, no, that's good, Your passion your passion is evident. And uh, for, for those in our audience who might be listening to this uh, a year or years from now, we're recording this on March the 3rd, 2022. And the Russian invasion of Ukraine is about a week or so old right now. So uh, just to give you an anchoring point for some of Paul's comments just a moment ago about the Ukrainian invasion. And uh, you guys have given us a lot to think about. So I, with that, uh, Gigi Mon and Paul Kobal, thank you both very much for being on the Cognitive Crucible. Thanks for the invite. Thank you. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.